Welcome back to another episode of Norse Studies with Zach. We're going over the culture of the Teutons. If you haven't watched any of my episodes, they're in 10 minute intervals. We're just reading this together. Feel free to start um, at any episode that you've missed. Go back through my page. You can catch up with us. It's pretty easy. We're just going to go through this book together, kind of discern uh, what Wilhelm Grombeck is trying to say about Norse culture. They lived as energetically as we do, found no less satisfaction in life, and felt themselves fully as much masters of life, masters who determined its aim and inflexibly had their way. But the recognition of this fact, in itself, emphasizes the distance between us, because it brings out more pointedly the difference between ancient and modern modes of conquering and enjoying life. So what's he saying? He's saying, essentially, that there's a distance between the ancient cultures and us. They, we both enjoy life, but in different ways. The difference is evident. The moment we compare the Teutons with other North, North European race of ancient times, the Celtic, for all our Germanic descent, we are more nearly related to the Celts. They are a more modern type of people, we might say. It needs not long acquaintance with them before one comes to intimacy. Here comes a man in whose face the whole world of nature and of man is reflected, the beauty of nature, the beauty of mankind, man's heroism, woman's love. These things thrill him and lead him into ecstasy. He feels and feels till his soul is ready to burst and then pours forth a lyric flood, plaintive and jubilant, wistfully pondering and earnestly exalting all, the delights, all that delights the eye. A religious ecstasy comes over him. He gives himself up to the invisible, grasping and surrendering himself at once, living the invisible as a reality with real joys and real sorrows. He flings himself over into the full experience of mysticism, yet without losing hold of the vis visible reality. On the contrary, his inner sense takes its fill of the beauty of nature, of delight in the animal life of earth and air. The violence of life meets an answering passion in himself. He must go with it, must feel his pulses beating in the same hurrying rhythm as that which he feels without him, without and about him. He can never make his pictures vivid enough, rich enough in color and shades of color. Beauty overwhelms him, and in his feverish eagerness to let nothing be lost, he loads one picture on another. The terror and grandeur of life excite him till he paints his giants and innumerable heads and every imaginable attribute of dread. Page 9. His heroes are of supernatural dimensions, with hair of gold or silver, more than, and more than godlike powers. Little wonder that the Celt often frightens and repels us by his formless exaggeration. He fills us at times with aversion, but only to attract us anew. Exaggeration is a natural consequence of passionate feeling that derives its strength and its character from the sensitiveness of the soul to everything about it, down to the faintest motions in the life of nature and man. <coughs> so he's talking about the Celts right now. It's not the Teutons. He's talking about the Celts. That's his description. This is where some of Wilhelm's writings get kind of complex because he, he switches back and forth in a way it, most people that aren't used to reading can't discern or can't differentiate between. Such a breadth of soul life is unknown among the Norsemen, not even to be found as an exception. So what he's saying is the Norsemen are different than the Celts and we relate more to the Celts in these aspects of our life. Compared with the Celt, the Northman is heavy, reserved, a child of earth, yet seemingly but half awakened. He cannot say what he feels, save by vague indignation, indication, in a long, roundabout fashion. He is deeply attached to the country that surrounds him. Its meadows and rivers fill him with a talent tenderness, 
but his home sense has not emancipated itself into love. The feeling for nature rings in muffled tones through his speech and through his myths, but he does not burst into song of the loveliness of the world. Of his relations with women, he feels no need to speak, save when there is something of a practical nature to be stated. Only when it becomes tragic does the subject enter into his poetry. In other words, his feelings are never revealed until they have brought about an event, and they tell us nothing of themselves, save by the weight and bitterness they give to the conflicts that arise. Uneventfulness does not throw him back upon his inner resources, and never opens up a flood of musings or lyricism. It merely dulls him. The Celt meets life with open arms, ready for every impression. He is loth to let any fall, anything fall dead before him. The Teuton is not lacking in passionate feeling, but he cannot. He will not help himself so loud, lavishly to life. <coughs> so he's not saying that the Teutons lacked feelings compared to the Celts or to compa compared to modern man. He's saying that the Teutons were more reserved in the feelings that they had. They didn't, you know, a lot of times, you know, it was typical for men, especially I'd say from the 50s maybe, maybe to like the 70s, 80s-ish, uh, a man was not expected, and this is just in the U.S., I'm, you know, I'm just trying to give comparison here. So a man was not expected to reveal things about himself. It didn't matter how bad he was feeling. It didn't matter, you know, who he was in love with. It didn't matter. All, all these things, they didn't, they didn't matter. Nobody cared about how, how they felt. And if you told somebody how you felt, people looked at you oddly. They, they thought you were weird. I'd say it was more of my generation um, and a little bit before me, myself, um, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, that people started, uh, men in particular, started opening up more about their feelings. You know, when you were sick at work, people say, how you doing? You know, the old, the old way was, oh, good, how are you? Whether or not you were good or not. Nowadays, you'll hear people talk, they'll tell you stories when you ask how they're doing. They'll tell you for days. So he's saying we relate more to the Celts because we're becoming, with every generation, more open with how we feel until, rather than the Teutons, who wouldn't say anything until something tragic happened. You know, you don't go out and proclaim your love for someone. You know, it, it's not until that person dies that you say, I loved them so much. That type of thing. Um, that's my assumption here. Okay? He might clarify more deeply in the next readings.